Very fortunate today to have our speaker, Marcelo Knorich Zufo from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Let me tell you a little bit about something about our speaker. Marcelo Knorich Zufo is full professor in the electronics department at the University of Sao Paulo Engineering School in Brazil. He is the director of Interdisciplinary Center for Interactive Technologies of the University of Sao Paulo. CITI USP. He is co founder and director of the LSI Tech, a research and development center that links the state of the art technologies developed in the university with the production, productive sector demands, developing new products and technologies. Sounds fun. He coordinates research and development in the field of electronic interactive media, focusing on digital health, high performance computing, virtual reality, computer graphics, and visualization. In 2001, he developed the first fully immersive virtual reality system in Brazil called Digital Cave. He is coordinator of the telemedicine network One, One Connect. One Connect? On Connect. On Connect. On Connect. On Connect. <clears throat> he was the international coordinator of ACM SIGGRAPH in 2000. He is the scientific coordinator of LEA, which has a key role in the national public key infrastructure in Brazil. He's participated actively in the definition of the Brazilian digital television system and is a member of the Brazilian DTV Forum since its establishment in 2007, where he is part of the advisory board and technical module coordinating the standards development related security for digital TV. He was awarded the Personality Award in, t in technolo Technology Innovation by the Syndicate of Engineers of the State of Sao Paulo in 2006. He was awarded the Medal of Merit by the Brazilian Navy in 2008, and the Victory Medal by the Ministry of Defense in 2009. He has, was the ACM Web 3D 2010 General Chair. So, as you can see, this is a very timely, we're very glad to have you, as we're very interested in all of these topics. So, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I think things are a little bit formal. Let's try to be a little bit more informal. Uh, I'm very glad, that we are on the immersion room. And I will talk a little bit about immersion. That has been key for the humanity in the past 10,000 years. So when humans start to, to draw things in caves, they are trying to design some technologies related to immersion. So uh, in my talk today, I will try to address this. I decided also to keep it a little bit informal because we recently, we have been awarded with a new center to do research in the long term. Uh, that's very unique in Brazil. Uh, our rector gave us money to think about computing for the next 10 years. Uh, that was not common in a developing country like Brazil. And that is giving us a great opportunity of brainstorming and think about everything, or he's thinking about everything. So, uh, uh, just to talk about Brazil, we are a 190 million people country. It's a very high symmetric country with many problems to be fixed. And that gives us a lot of opportunities of applying what we do at the university uh, directly to society. So many problems that we are facing in this fast growing process we have been invited by many organizations in the Brazilian society, and more recently, Latin America, uh, regarding fixing these problems using state-of-art technology. So particularly, um, I live in Sao Paulo. That's a pretty big city, fourth biggest in the world. We have 12 million citizens. But it's quite interesting, because we belong to a state that is a kind of California. So I, I pressure my politicians all the time, stating that Sao Paulo needs to enhance its uh, partnership with California. If you see the structure of my university, it's basically University of California. It's a state-funded university. And with the newer economical growth, uh, the total budget of my university now raised more than $2 billion. And all this money came from the public sector. Uh, what is interesting about Sao Paulo, uh, we concentrate 70% of the world production of oranges. We are three times bigger than Florida. And we host 33% of the Brazilian GDP. Uh, what that means? That means that the country is very high symmetric. I mean, we live together with the new and the past, the good and the bad, 
and the poor and the rich. Uh, that's a local uh, characteristic of Brazil. Uh, particular São Paulo University, we are the top research university in Latin America now. We have been ranked at the top 75 most reputed university, and for many years we are already the number one uh, Latin university, including French-speaking universities like French universities. So that's a problem to us, and you see why, because uh, we are a kind of University of California, the same model. We have campuses scattered across the whole state. It's a state-sponsored university. But we are super biased in research. We are a research university, mainly. And because that, um, we have a larger campus at Sao Paulo City that was a previous coffee farm. But we, we answer to a significant amount of the high-impact Brazilian research in Brazil. Uh, 27%. So 27% of everything related to high-impact, prestigious research in the country is being produced by USP. So, um, and that are our growing numbers in the past years. And that gives us a problem because at the same time that we need to get more approximation with Berkeley, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, we still want a developing country. So uh, we need to see how we can use our research uh, to fix many of our national problems that range from computing to deep ocean oil drilling, uh, defense, and everything. So uh, under this context, um, USP, I don't know how it works in here, but we receive 5% of Sao Paulo taxes. So 5% uh, of everything that is collected at Sao Paulo State is driven directly to USP. So uh, in the old, old times, it was really bad because this money means nothing. Recently, it's an incredible big amount of money. Um, last year, around 5 billion reais. That is two and a half billion dollars. So uh, we fortunately now we had a, a rector that was graduated at Harvard. So he had this international vision. So we signed up many agreements with MIT, Harvard, and recently with Berkeley. So we have a very strong academic exchange program between USP, State of Sao Paulo University, and Berkeley for exchanging students, postdoctorals, and professors. And also the rector, he created this program. He allocated $100 million for long-term programs. He's meaning 10 years. So he gave us the opportunity of propose research topics for 2023. We never did that before. We used to see that in the US. We participate in some international consortia with Europe. But we, ne we never had a chance to do that at Brazil. So my group that belongs to the electrical and computing engineering department, he said, we need to make it. We need to try to do something really good uh, in this topic. So uh, we had time to, to discuss, and then we decided to focus in human-computer interaction but not this current definition of human-computer interaction. We are trying to reinvent this concept, considering what will be the future 10 years from now. So uh, we want to research and innovate interactive technologies in the long term. So uh, since we had a key participation defining our digital TV standard, participating in the big events, you know that next year we will run the World Cup, and two years later, uh, the World Cup, uh, the Olympics in 2016. We are discussing the analog switch off for digital TV in 2016. We try to transfer everything that we do at the university to society. And we try to organize that on a better way. So we created this uh, think tank. And we have two policies, um, two strategies 
to promote public policies at governmental level. The first one is trying to embed visual analytics in the industry policy. Because developing countries, they need to do decision making all the time. And many times we do a lot of mistakes. So we understand that when a society do better decision making, they, they get competitiveness and they do the better for the people. So um, we have this idea uh, of embedding visual analytics in the industry policy, as well as in the defense pol policy. If you see Brazil, we share borders with uh, 11 countries. And for the past 150 years, we didn't shoot a single bullet in the borders. But if you consider Brazil to another country like Russia, China, with the similar amount of borders, it's quite complicated. So uh, our defense policy is basic in soft uh, power. So we try to avoid war in all meanings. But the borders are getting complicated every day, mainly because drugs. So we want to have uh, visual analytics and visualization techniques to visualize drug routes and see how we can prevent uh, our border away from drug guerrilla. Also, uh, we have the Fab Lab. That is this concept proposed by Neil Gershenfeld about digital prototyping almost everything. And basically, USP gave us around $2.5 million for the next three years. It was a super highly competitive bit. We compete with everybody at the university, and we are super well positioned in our proposal. So we have a building now. So city has a building, and professors from all schools. So we have professors from the medical school cancer, so pediatric cancer. So we are helping them establishing our national database for childhood cancer and heart disease. Uh, we have professors from the music school in psychoacoustics. We have professors from electrical engineering. Vilhelmus Vanoy is a famous professor in Brazil on IC design, as well as professors from the mechatronics. And in the first floor, we have the Fab Lab. LG Electronics donated us this prototyping machine, and we can prototype 10,000 samples in two days. So any kind of integrated electronics, uh, we can integrate and test it. So uh, probably you heard about Raspberry Pi and Arduinos. We are manufacturing these toys in this Fab Lab. We help the local industry designing cell phones, digital TV sets, any kind of electronics. But we try also to induce um, open designs like Raspberry Pis and Arduinos. So what is our scenario? Uh, creating city, we try to decide how will be world in 2022. Anybody thought about that before? And so anybody try to investigate how will be our population curves in the next 10 years? It's very interesting. We don't know. For years, uh, humans are interactive with tools. And more recently, we are interacting with that kind of tools very early. And uh, if you see humanity, we don't know what will happen after uh, 2018. We got some United Nations statistic, statistics. So when we see the numbers, we know that humanity grow really slowly until Second World War because mainly violence and mainly disease. So many diseases like tuberculosis um, and another viruses uh, keep children mortality very high. And, and old people usually not survive. It's very unique, we are talking about being grandparents and grandmothers. Uh, only recent uh, generations are having this possibility. It was very rare living together with a grandfather or a grandmother before the 40s. And then what we know, that everything, including internet, is dramatically increasing the amount of people in this world. And we're facing many problems because of that. 
But we cannot guess what will happen by 2018. Eventually, we will collapse, probably not. Eventually, we will stabilize, or eventually, we will decline. The only thing that we, we are sure, based on current statistics that we have from the United Nations, is that by 2020, we will be around 7 to 8 billion people. And about computers. I know, and I apologize if I say any mistake, I am among the best ex experts in this topic. We know that uh, the total number of computers is increasing a lot. During the Olympics, because our framework cooperating with British to run Olympics in Brazil, I decided to visit a company called Arm. And they told me already that at this moment, in 2012, last year, they manufacture five computers per woman. So they shipped last year 25 billion, 25 billion CPUs. So 25 divided by six is around four CPUs per human. If you consider Intel, uh, MIPS, and other microprocessor manufacturers, we can guess five to six. So since that's about Moore law, and we have these logarithms, and it's very hard to control logarithms, we are, we are saying that eventually, by two, 2022, we'll have around 100 to 1,000 computers per room. It's just a guess, you know? Sorry, per human? Per human. 100 to 1,000. That could, it's a very speculative thing, and we can discuss hours about that. But that is not the point. That is a fact. I mean, industry is moving towards this direction. And we, as academics, we don't have too much to do about that, eventually fixing some problems. So when we proposed at City, we said, what is the value proposition from the research point of view? We want to research the interaction among these two entities, humans and computers, on a different kind of way. Eventually, the paradigms that we are using today to investigate human-computer interaction will be a completely nonsense in 10 years from now. And in our research, we had discovered this guy, Lick Leiter. So we know that he had a strong de debate with Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky had this idea that computer would be a sort of third or fourth brain, expanding our abilities. But we are preferring this approach of man-computer symbiosis. It's a kind of symbiosis, because you see that innovation computing is happening, happening pretty fast. And when you see the humanity, uh, children mortality is decreasing, aging is increasing, maybe because the internet, uh, maybe because newer drugs that are being simulated every day, maybe because uh, health information, education that is scattering across the whole globe. So uh, one of the programs that we have inside City is revisiting leak lighter ideas and try to observe if this phenomenon of what we call co-evolution between humans and computers is happening or not. I know that's a crazy idea, but USP gave us money to do that, you know? For the first time, we, we can be a little bit more ambitious uh, and, and crazy about the future. So, uh, the way how we wrote it in the proposal was, we will try to give an emphasis on multidisciplinary work in fundamental scientific problems of human-machine interaction slash symbiosis, both in theoretical and applications. A better understanding of these problems and their solutions will profoundly affect human life. So uh, then we submit this proposal, and voila, we got this funding. So uh, the research topics that we listed, visual computer analytics, AGCI, visualization, immersive technologies, new devices, new materials, media engineering, including consumer electronics, audio and sound. And the application domains are health, education, accessibility, security. And we have some what we call Brazilian challenges, like the international games, oil and gas exploration, and environment. You know that we have a big piece of green land, and we need to preserve that. 
So when Professor Yan Habai visited us and was talking about the swarm, I said, oh Jesus, how we can use this swarm to preserve Amazon? How we can use this swarm to pres preserve ocean? How we can use the swarm to preserve our biodiversity and everything? So, particular in visual analytics and immersion, uh, the, the most efficient way of interacting with computers are through visual means. So, we understand that um, visual analytics and visualization is a soft kind of brain machine, brain computer interface. In this case, uh, we would like to combine, based on leak light ideas, highly interactive decision making processes with analytical reasoning and also great society innovation. So, uh, I will show you some projects that we started last year. Eventually, the projects are not fulfilling the ideas that we proposed. As I say all the time in our center, we are flying with this plane under construction. Uh, because, you know, uh, we don't have the same tradition that you have in the U.S. of establishing these multidisciplinary centers. We have some references, like the Swarm Lab, the National Center for Supercomputer Applications at University of Illinois, but we never had the chance of practicing that in the country. And we know that some mistakes could occur. Well, one program that we set up last January was a partnership with Boeing. So Boeing Company is establishing a research center at Brazil, and they are signing up agreements with many universities, including USP. And with us, uh, they sign up an agreement with uh, a topic on crowd behavior simulation. We are partnering with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the group led by Professor Henry Fux and Professor Dinesh Manosha. They are designing some tools for crowd behavior. And we want to use these crowd behavior uh, models for crisis any kind of crisis. For example, uh, I have a demo in here uh, that is available in our website. It's just a proof of concept. We have a 737, and for some reason, we decide to press the panic button. And then, that's a simulation based on UNC stuff. My group ported it to JavaScript, and we embedded some behavioral um, models based on uh, statistical envelopes. So we can simulate uh, people escaping from a plane. And then we can model the distance between seats. We can model the evacuation routes. And we are combining, in this case, visual analytics and also uh, immersive technologies. I will stay the next two days at UNC Chapel Hill trying to uh, discuss the deliverable of, of this project. But particularly in planes, we want to design this cave, this plane with virtual reality, and put inside a cave. And now problems that we face all the day uh, on a plane, the shorter space between seats, uh, the route uh, that usually are very tight, we will try to simulate using these technologies. That's our first deliverable. Uh, we are having a really hard time with Boeing about how they make us available the real designs of these planes because we are a public university and Boeing is a private company and they have NDAs that are sub super tough, but we will make it. The sec Excuse? Because uh, it's just a prototype. We are, it's a work in progress. Oh, yeah. At this moment, we are grabbing FAA. Yeah. It's just a demo. Right. Um, it's not, how I say, calibrated for the real world, including the real time. Right. But what we tested in this demo, uh, the models for collision detection provided by Unici are very scalable. We can go up to 100,000 humans. 
And at this moment, we are running this application in the web. So the performance is not good. But however, we can simulate that. And, and we want to keep that in the web, considering the interactivity, because security forces in Brazil, they don't have computers everywhere. So keeping web-based technologies is good because uh, firemen officers and defense officers scattered across the whole country can validate and analyze these models. So here is just a demo. It's not a real certificated FAA or Boeing stuff. In fact, my students did that in two weeks just because we had a Boeing visit last Saturday. We have a one-day seminar discussing the possibilities. Does yeah. the nature of the emergency affect the performance of the crowd? Let's say that if there's a fire or there's something else going on. So it's, it's, it's more panic-driven than less panic-driven. Does that affect the way they Absolutely. We have a collaborator in our lab that is tetraplegic. So many years ago, he had an accident, and then he lost all movement below his neck. We had a crisis in our airport uh, two months ago because his wheelchair stuck it uh, in the 737 exit route. And that stuck it. People that start to become nervous, and this crisis contaminated the whole section of that airport. So we're not taking only about fiery or terrorism or violence, but even if the distribution of population changes inside the plane from children to older people, the behavior is completely different. And that's where we are trying to measure in this project. Also, we will measure that for planes, airports, and also stadiums. That's why we need some models with more than 100,000 people, the crowds during the games. So that's one project where we're combining this. Uh, visual analytics and education. How's a developing center? The science museums are asking us to design stuff. So uh, we create a program to promote science engineering education in Brazil. So uh, the Sao Paulo Science and Technology Museum invited us to design two simulators, a spaceship and a submarine. So we just announced these simulators. So we are using very nice, low-cost VR and interactive techniques. And usually, uh, it's a kind of game. So up to 16 children, they can fix science engineering problems, mathematics problems like controlling the fuel up to Mars, or trying to avoid a collision with a meteor. And to fix these problems, they use visual analytics tools. So we simplify these models so children can touch and play and fix these problems. And according they fix these mathematical and physics and chemistry problems, they can reach their goal. Uh, we are starting to measure the behavior of children inside this, but that's a very unique and uh, newer thing that we finished a month ago. And we use some virtual reality techniques. That is the moon, you know, the Earth. We are using here a 64, 55-inch uh, TV sets to do so. Well, uh, super reality. We did this very boring thing that was establishing uh, the national digital TV standard. Uh, one achievement that we had, and Liza Costa had a particular key role in this process, we convinced our president that HDTV is a good thing. You know, on a developing country, uh, some people have fears against technology. They believe that sometimes technology is too expensive, or sometimes technology can, can uh, lead for small, less jobs. So about uh, high definition, the question was, could be very expensive to our lower income population. It was a completely mistake. Last year, Brazil was the third biggest market on HD in Brazil. But basically, uh, when we shifted it from standard definition to high definition, we just did that very little step. Yesterday, I was at Las Vegas at NAB, and we're discussing 
what we call super high vision. That, that's resolution. We want to do the first trial out uh, on super high vision for the games. So uh, a, a super high vision camera uses state of art um, CCD technology. So NHK and Sony Labs are designing this stuff. But frankly speaking, if, even if it goes to super high vision, we, we, we saw our videos yesterday, it's not enough to the human eye. It's still very low. So uh, why not at City investigate beyond ultra high vision? Well, how we can eventually design this place that can have a higher resolution than the human eye. And that's also a complicated thing because we have an approach that is combining projectors. And when we consider the energy driven by the human eye is less than 0.5 watt. No, 0.5 milliwatt. And when we try to combine, let's say, like University of New York at Stony Brook, they are doing, they just announced the first one and a half billion pixel display ever built in the earth. They are consuming something like half megawatt. Using projectors, we agree that uh, if we combine desktop projectors like this, we will need 1,000. Each projector consuming one kilowatt, including computer, GPUs, everything, we will need one megawatt. That is 10% of the energy of the whole campus at USP. And my reactor will kill me, you know, fire me if I do that. So, um, at this moment, we have our cave. You know, it's a five-side immersive room. And we decide to use this approach of combining projectors. So currently, in our cave, we have 36 projectors driving it. Uh, we use this approach of what we call uh, ad hoc, casual projector allocation. I mean, in the video, my students are just dropping projectors in the table, and that's the final result. We designed some algorithms based on camera sensors that can do geometric and color calibration real time. And we are applying that uh, for Petrobras. So we're discussing with Petrobras designing a new system with a hundred projectors. And the problem is energy, because we need something like 200 kilowatt to drive this system. Well, having, uh, basically, uh, we are using desktop projectors. And any kind of calibration, including physical calibration, means cost. So uh, we spend, uh, in this approach, we spend less than half a minute to calibrate our projectors. If we do by hand, we can spend hours. So in our approach, and that's about the swarm too. Yeah. Uh, in here, uh, the projectors, uh, they vary their behavior from time to time. Lamps, it's lamps are a problem. And now, so we want to have flexibility. Why the cave need to be fixed? Why we need to have the, the singularities in the corners? Why projectors are so heavy? So, uh, so uh, regarding this, um, we built this facility a year ago, and that's our production facility. Uh, in 3D UI, uh, last year, we submitted a proposal to the IEEE 3D UI context, and we got the third place in the context. What is more important is that we use this multi-projector, self-calibrated camera thing 
Collaborative applications in virtual environments allow users to interact with each other in so different when we ways, diverging from the usual communication tool set we use every you day. See that For this year's 3D UI contest, two users should interact well. in separate rooms in order to help each other. The caveat is that verbal and non-verbal communication is not possible since they are in separate rooms. Our setup is composed of two different VR environments, a cave system composed of three high resolution walls with six projectors each and a stereo power wall system. The cave system is used by the explorer. For the 3D UI contest, the explorer is the user who sees the VR environment in a first person mode. His objective is to traverse the VR environment which in this case is a maze with the help of a second user, the power user. The power wall is used by the power user. The power user is the one who sees the VR environment in its entirety, similar to the word in miniature metaphor. His objective is to guide the explorer through the maze, by giving him non-verbal hints. The VR environment is a maze model in Maya, all rooms look similar. The maze is also composed of multiple floors. The explorer navigates in this world using a point and go metaphor. He simply points to where he wants to go using a remote controller. A virtual line connecting the remote in his hand and the target surface is rendered in the VR environment. The explorer can then pull himself automatically in the direction between his hand and the end of the virtual line. This can be seen by the red line connecting the remote device and the VR environment. The explorer holds in his hand a modified remote controller attached to an optical tracking device. The user points to where he wants to go and locks the virtual direction by clicking one of the remote buttons. Holding this same button again automatically pulls the user towards the select direction. We assume there is no gravity in this environment, allowing the user to fly up and down to navigate between multiple floors. This allows the user to explore each room in the maze in its entirety. The power user has a global view of the VR environment. The power wall system used is composed of a single 3D stereo projector. Using hand gesture, he can control his view of the VR environment. The interaction device is a William Chuck Plus remote coupled with an infrared LED. This LED is tracked using two remotes for its position in space. To rotate the VR world using this configuration, the power user drags a William Chuck in space around a pivot. Both the pivot and the William Chuck have a virtual representation on the VR environment. Using one of the remote buttons, the user can rotate the virtual environment around the pivot. The second button can be used in the same fashion to translate the virtual environment. The position of the pivot can also be controlled using the nunchuck. The power user can see where the explorer is in the virtual environment world. To give hints to the explorer, the power user can illuminate pathways in this maze. To do that, the power user positions the virtual representation of the nunchuck in the virtual environment and clicks a button on the remote to drop a line point source. The explorer sees this light point and then knows which direction to take in the maze. The point and go technique allows the explorer to quickly navigate through the VR environment. Since he is immersed in a cave system, he can look around him to see the possible exits in each room. Light point sources are a subtle yet effective way to hint the explorer to where he should go next. Our pilot studies show that the user enjoyed using this combined system for navigation and exploration. So we hear the beauty of this is not exactly what we did for the 3D UI context, but our developing regarding scalable multi-projectors are quite robust because that kind of application really excites too much the system. You know, we're having in the back uh, 18 computers driving these 36 projectors, and the system is quite robust. So considering that, we decided to be a little bit more ambitious and try to embed this software at the projectors itself. Because at this moment, we are using desktop projectors and the computer has an external infrastructure. So that came out with the idea of the Firefly project. At this moment, uh, you're gonna still need a megawatt, right? You, you make 
So uh -huh. that problem. Well, that's the main problem. Is that by basically distributing computation in the projectors? Yeah. Or is it getting more lower power projectors? Not that's scale, right? Is the question is of the parameters. That's uh, the answers that we're trying to fix in the Farify project. So uh, the Farify, it's a new program that we started at City trying to fix the energy problem. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, and I know that's very exciting and speculative. We don't know our answers, but it's a kind of project that are exciting because it boasts an, a lot of new problems. So in our hands, we have an scalable piece of software. So we are saying 100 projectors, but in our simulations, we can go to 1,000 or 2,000. So eventually, we can go to 2,000 megapixels, that is two gigapixels. <laughs> I have an even more fundamental question. Yeah. Why? Why? What application even you have that really promotes from the cave? Because everybody with prestige and money has a cave at some point. Yeah. They all have it for demonstration. I've never really seen anybody do it. Yes, really correct. Perfect. 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 Going a step beyond and having this really, really high resolution cave where you ask the question, what is the application except an occasion show off? such a thing, and is, is it really worthwhile having other than having fun, which of course is by itself a volume. Perfect, yeah. You, you pose the two fundamental questions. First of all, energy. And second of all, these systems are super expensive. So uh, the Firefly project, we try to fix these two problems. So why not designing a gigapixel display system with less than $50,000? instead of $2 million that are currently the caves available. I run, I run, uh, Professor Henry Fux is our advisor. Yeah, no, he has been talking about this for yeah. the last 15 years. That's yes. Three. Yeah. And actually, I very much agree yeah. with Carlo. Yeah. Mean, <clears throat> we agree all together. That's a problem, a, pro a point. I go even yeah. further and I've seen, yeah. you know, cave has certain you know, yeah. Movement from one person. So focus it with the ultimate movie glasses. Yep. Where you make just use of the full resolution of your eye, but everyone has their individual display, you know, head mounted Correct. and all of that. Correct. You can still get the simulation where they feel like they're the same room. Yep. Wouldn't that be a better way and in a way more scalable and more flexible? That's the point. So uh, the f actually <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. That's a good discussion. It's a good discussion. Yeah, because it's too expensive. Yeah. Well, I'm 
I'm saying you know, some you know, really good technology <laughs> display and boom glasses is in a very good stack. Of course, we've been working towards that for uh -huh. 20 years, and UNC was very much ahead of its time That's at some right. point. Yep. In 96, I spent the sabbatical year. But my opening talk when I started my sabbatical year was the title that uh, 3D is not always more than 2D. Because at that point, they took any problem they had and they translated into 3D immersive environment because they had it and it was fun. Even problems that were basically two-dimensional problems, like, like finding the direction for optimal irradiation of a vulnerable you know, of a tumor through all of organs, it's a 2D problem. It's basically pi and theta. They projected that where they put the man who's name on the display at the center of the tumor, looking around, seeing the heart pulsing up there, the liver over there, and kind of looking where do they see the most sky. I pointed out that's really stupid. You know, you can really display that on the screen, essentially, on a little globe, twirl it around and says, is the Atlantic Ocean bigger than the Indian Ocean? Which one shall I pick? And so we had some very productive time after that. I then worked very hard with one of the students of Fred Brooks, with Martin May, to try to find some tasks that clearly could be done better in an immersive environment than non immersive. And we had to look really, really hard. We found a few. One of them is forming a 3D buyer to match this original because you can then combine it with proprioception. And if you have the tactile feeling and the proprioception and really the 3D vision, then you can do better than anything you do with a screen, as a mouse, or with any sophisticated devices. So we found a few, but not that many. And so every time we have somebody who's a really fancy cave, I'm saying, it's great and it's wonderful and it's good to show off. Can you do real work eight hours a day, every day, you know, for two years and be productive in it? And what would that work be? Yeah. I think that are excellent questions. I'm struggling with these questions for 12 years because 21 first now we will celebrate 12 years of our first cave in Brazil. After that, our companies like Embraer, Petrobras, our national Brazilian companies did massive investments. And sometimes I'm a little bit frustrated because most of them use that for demos only, for marketing, saying, okay, I'm a high tech company. We do high-tech stuff, and I have a high-tech toy, you know? But basically, my main criticism to immersive technology, and we, I discussed that a lot with Professor Henry, is that it's too rigid. It's not flexible. Uh, it's not cheap. and uh, demands a lot of energy. When I was younger, I, I remember powering up my cave, and then suddenly part of the electrical engineering department should treat off. I said, well, maybe a problem from the electricity. It was me, you know, burning the grid at my department. So energy has, uh, Jan mentioned it, it's a problem. So in the Firefly, Firefly project, we are trying to fix or at least address these problems. So um, we want to have a kind of brick, a light brick. So, uh, with these bricks, we can cluster them. Oh, yes. When, when we start to figure out that the cave didn't fix everything, we start to move outdoors and try to fix the, the problem in a different way using immersive technologies. So the nave frigate simulator, the spaceship simulator, and many other simulators, they use this kind of immersive and interactive technology. Not exactly a cave, but the same substrate, substrate. and that's important. So in this way, especially in a developing country like Brazil, sometimes we have some mental crisis saying, well, I'm wasting money or public money. Still, we have children not studying well in high schools. So that kind of pressure and discussion is sometimes even higher on a developing country like Brazil. Do you want screen, multiple screens? Well, 
Yeah, those are need this set to be a cave, but it's immersive and interactive. Uh, and caves and caves have the singularity. Mathematically speaking, the corners are very hard to to try. So in the far we far Yeah. yeah. So it's about one of our trials with Firefly is try to design spherical displays. Yes, yeah, so you can make a curve to bring the tiles together that eventually makes a sphere of that many yeah. diameter or yeah. something. We have some stuff submitted, but we're waiting the answer from Sigrus. We submit already some stuff on this. So answering uh, the point of Ian, we want to have the brick with consuming less than five watt. So if we have a thousand, a swarm with a thousand fireflies, we will consume less than five kilowatt. That's roughly the same amount of energy of this kind of projector. Or no, a big projector, a cinema kind projector. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you take these super high end 4K projectors from Sony, they consume uh, five, 10 kilowatt. So they need to be low cost. So our target is $50. So 1,000 plus $50, we are talking about $50,000. Need to be fully wireless because the cables are heavier than the projectors. We are talking about this kind of projectors. They are, we are talking about this kind, these projectors. They are solid state. Mm -hmm. um, you can purchase one of these at Brook Store for $200, mm -hmm. but in fact they cost $30 at, in China, in high manufacturing. So uh, my students and me, we are redesigning these projectors to become then fully wireless and embedding uh, programmability. So we, by now, in our demos, you need to have this HDMI cable, but we want to remove the HDMI cable. We want to have a GPU and CPU inside. And the resolution needs to be square. We dislike four by three. That is for marketing purposes. Uh, it's wrong here. We want to have 600 by 600 pixels. Uh, and we want to embed our scalable compositing techniques. So, uh, investigating uh, firefly swarms, I know that I'm talking with experts on swarms in here, so I need to be careful. Uh, tropical fireflies routinely synchronize their flashes among large groups. So that is the key algorithms that we're embedding in these projectors. They need to synchronize uh, color, geometry, and contrast to give us an homogeneous okay. image perspective. So it's not so much synchronization, it's more like a, an adoption of the parameters. Right? It's, uh, right? We say calibration, but we have frame rates, you know. And 60 hertz is not enough because 60 hertz is the lower human eye bound. Uh, if you go to... These things seem to vary at that frequency. I mean, yeah, there's time varying time constant that projects may age differently or whatever. So we have to adjust them, but not 69 seconds. Have you seen already uh, native 240 hertz TV sets? They drive you 3D without glasses. 30 hertz, 60 hertz are the upper bound frequency of the human eye. Uh, some subjective analysis states that the human eye performance can realize higher than 500 hertz. So since we're in here, we're using DLP projectors that are based on MEMS, and these mirrors can go up to five kilohertz. Why not synchronizing these pixels in upper frequencies? 
Nobody did that before, so we want to investigate what happens if we do so. I see, I see the first Energy K 8K TV set yesterday with thousands of people at NEB. Uh, it's amazing. It's 3D without glasses. They show it shooting from soccer, shooting from uh, carnival, ocean. Uh, it's amazing. It's 3D. And, and then we, we are collaborating with Sony Labs, and they show it as a native 240 hertz native. Because when you purchase at Best Buy, it's uh, that 240 hertz is interpolated to control the relaxation of the uh, LCD molecule. So it's not true 240. It's a kind of fake algorithm to avoid ghosting. But when you see a truly 240 hertz image, they become 3D. So uh, these projectors basically are marketed for this kind of stuff. So it's possible to change the film of such projectors to our needs. So we are trying to do that. You know? It's a research program, very ambitious, very innovative. But the university gives us money for this. And we trust that's a good idea. Uh, at least we are having a super good debate, you know? Uh, the same kind of debates that we're having here. At my lab, we have all the time, the pros, the against. Uh, and I think that's a kind of science, too. I mean. There's something, uh, I'm not arguing about the need for synchronization. I think there yeah. are a lot of cases of the yeah. networks. Yeah. The key problem, however, is your Firefly synchronization. Even says it's space synchronization. Have you ever watched a movie of Fireflies? Yeah. Uh, how they synchronize? It is really, you can see waves. Yeah. It's a kind of systolic computing. Yeah. And you see the waves going. Yeah. So actually, this is a very scary. I think you really apply this to a big display application because indeed you will not have pure You don't have absolute synchronization. You have synchronization in a lot of neighborhoods. That's what you get. Within a certain region, you know they have synchronization. But the other region is going to be something drifting away from you. Yeah. So that, we, we looked at that actual synchronization of chips. Uh, yeah. No, I, I'm just quoting okay. white pigeon, you know. Uh, that's it. Uh, however, uh, we are using hierarchical trees to synchronize our projectors. Mm -hmm. So eventually, to keep performance, we can have a high symmetric behavior. The human eye is very unlinear. Despite we have a, a very linear stuff in here, the human eye behaves completely different. So that's a kind of thing that we're discussing in our lab tour. So uh, the concept idea is redesigning these PICO projectors according to these specifications. So uh, we are uh, discussing internally uh, the requisites uh, it's very hard having support from industry because the whole industry is biased in that kind of stuff. And when we came out asking this sort of stuff, they said, you guys are crazy, nobody will purchase it. But it's research, you know. Uh, fortunately, uh, Texas Instruments decide to support us, technically. So there are two engineers from Texas Instruments that are helping us uh, designing this stuff. Um, basically, we want to remove um, the Wi-Fi, and we want to have only the power supply. We don't want to have any cable connecting it. So somehow, uh, the f uh, and also I, I forgot to mention that, we will need to have some cameras attached to Firefly groups. So uh, these chipsets, we can embed uh, CCDs. They don't need to be necessarily high definition. We are using statistical methods. So the CCD is just a sensor doesn't need to be ultra high definition CCDs. Standard low cost uh, webcams, older generations, are more than enough. Because we use the CCDs only for um, calibration purposes. Uh, they need to be high frequency, but not super high frequency. I'm saying 120 hertz, 240 hertz. And also, they, ideally, they could be infrared to work with structured light. 
Um, it's very easy embedding these projectors an extra infrared LED for calibration purposes. And we have a video uh, to show some results. Uh, to plug this, we're using Lego. Some reviewers dislike it. They hate us, in fact. So it's my student calibrating four projectors. That's a Firefly cluster. So we have first geometrical calibration, then color and contrast. So here is in Portuguese, but basically we are saying the, 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 the following. Uh, our approach scales up in pixel and energy. So uh, if you use conventional systems price across resolution, they are scalable in price and energy exponentially. So we compare many projectors of the market in terms of energy and price. They have this behavior and then they saturate. But when we use the Firefly approach, they scale linearly. Uh, of course, of course, yeah. Um, but that's not because the projectors, but that's because the computing infrastructure behind them. Uh, that's why we want to embed this GPU inside. And you're correct on this. So we're claiming that we want to have fully automatic calibration, uh, illimited uh, resolution. And also we are asking money to government, say, then we claim that is a national technology, you know, so our means of science technology can become happy about that. So, uh, at this moment, uh, USP and Berkeley, we sign up an agreement. Um, my department uh, selected very hard and rigorously uh, Liza Costa to come here. We know that Berkeley is a very high prestigious top university. Uh, and then um, somehow USP, they sent a delegation to Berkeley recently to sign up this agreement. It's main office to main office agreement. But we do believe that the CT lab can collaborate with the SWARM lab in same goals. Um, and probably uh, the universities will agree uh, funding visiting professors, visiting students, and postdoctoral positions is what I heard. So uh, both Berkeley and USP, they, they make available these funds. It seems that we just need to submit proposals for them. So that's it. Uh, it's very... Uh, so with the um, with the Pico projectors, I know they um, the amount of lumens that they give out is fairly low. Um, what about like how many? So there's a standard projector right there. How many Pico projectors would I need to get sort of the same number of lumens? And then do you come up to like is it now is it now the same amount of cost to get the same amount of lumens? And then I mean I guess then you. Do you really need a cave that has like no windows or ambient light in order to sort of realize this system? That's a very good question. Uh, this Pico has only seven lumens. If you go to Brookstore now, you can purchase one with a hundred lumens. That size. That size. No, a little bit bigger. Because a little bit bigger. Yeah, it's an it's a newer DLP with twice resolution too. This one is 240 per 320, and the newest one is 600 by 684. 
uh, and 85 lumens. We have in our hands, in our lab, already some projectors like this with 300 lumens and lasers instead of. But for us, lighting doesn't matter. What really matters is the control upon the LEDs. We need to have frame synchronization. So uh, having the programmability upon the LD is very important for the Firefly project. So in our design, we want to have control upon the light, the LED. So we want to drive it exactly what we need uh, to keep uh, contrast high. So there are many algorithms published in the literature about contrast enhancement. If you go to a Best Buy and you see the newest Samsung TV set with infinite contrast, it's because and if you see the LCD data sheets, they doesn't match. It's because they have some LLD controlling, diming, uh, dynamically LLD diming. We want to use the same techniques in our swarm fireflies. Uh, and, and we don't want to have a cave. You are correct, we are trying to build a sphere because we don't have the singularities. So, uh, we don't know exactly, it's a research topic. We are trying to have a, a radiosity approach. I don't know if you know these energy balancing algorithms. I have a postdoctoral that is trying to model a swarm with 100, 200 projectors, uh, calibrating black offset, because black is not black in these projectors. So we are trying to turn off all LLDs when we have black and also uh, trying to fix the interference problems uh, between projectors. But nowadays, um, the state of art are 300, 300 uh, lumens, uh, projectors that kind. Like was, uh, 2000. 2000. So what's interesting yeah. about this approach yeah. is if you can get the synchronization problem solved, yeah. what you've done is effectively lower the power density of a projector. Yes. And that's, that's the way to get that curve be flat because the, the cost is going up because the power yeah. density is so high in, yeah. in the lamp and in the, right, that's what makes that a really expensive projector at the high end. Two thirds of the energy in the projector is the lamp. And I don't know if you know these older projectors, they have a protection in case of the lamp explode. Okay. So yeah. it, it, when these lamps explode, they behave like a grenade, you know? So they have a, a shield to protect it against um, right. uh, right. explosion, yeah. uh, and also um, the energy dissipation is a tricky engineering problem right. in these projectors. So diming, you are correct. Uh, when we, we dime the LLD, we want to control the energy of our projectors. Yeah, so it's a nice scalability approach. I mean, yeah. It clearly could be interesting. The, the videos looked interesting. I, I was a little bit curious. We've seen some demonstrations of other walls that are not that old, two, two or three-year-old walls that have a lot of temporal jitter. I mean, you, you didn't talk about time synchronization, but I've seen a lot of serious problems where the, if you have 64 displays, they're off, you know, not by 20 milliseconds, but off by 200 milliseconds. And you start, it's a very distracting, irritating effect, right, where yeah. each frame is is one or two frames behind a neighbor, that kind of effect. I'm kind of curious, uh, you didn't talk about what's going on behind the scenes here. Uh, data representation approaches, programming environments and such, and computing environments uh, that give you the time synchronization so that you can focus on the more interesting spatial synchronization problems that you're describing. Yeah. Um, I give 12 years ago a lecture at Seagraph about that. When SCGIs are start to bankrupt, has a model providing high-end graphics, and people start to use PC clusters instead. So basically you have three synchronization hierarchies. You have the frame sync, you have pixel sync, and then you have database, you know, pixel frame and database sync. And they can be decoupled. You can run your simulation at 50 hertz, and then you can run your rendering, your pixel rendering at 200 hertz, and then you run your frame display at 60 hertz. 
So uh, basically, we are trying to use uh, n-level architecture. And we are studying how to couple it. Um, we don't want to use a supercomputer to drive these 1,000 fireflies. So my, com my group, because we want to keep everything cheap. Of course, cloud computing, it is the natural way to go. But how? How to couple a cloud to the swarm? Uh, for us, in our discussions, maybe you guys fixed it, it's still an open problem to us, you know? We are really trying to focus synchronization, synchroniz synchronizing uh, these projectors. And, and we have a good application that are high energy collision, where in one experience we have ultra high definition imaging. So we are talking with the Department of Physics about visualizing uh, phenomena collision phenomena in this kind of super projector. You know, we want to build uh, the cheapest 8K display ever, you know, um, because I tried to purchase a 8K display from Sharp last year. Uh, they charged me half a million dollars, $500,000 for a hundred... Yeah, maybe, maybe. But there's no, there's no video source. No, there is, there is. Uh, Sony just announced yesterday a newer $75,000 camera that grabs 8K, but they have many fiber optics, and it's hard to extract the 8K image from there. Yeah, they have, uh, it's very interesting from the engineering point of view, these cameras, because they have chains and chains of fiber optics connected to, to a super server besides. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, once again, the issue is it's now it's communication density. Yeah. Right? Through this little skinny pipe, if you can if you can parallelize that and lower the communication density, you've got a lower. So I mean, your approach has a lot of it's scalability in a lot of different angles. We're certainly interested in the the operating system that would drive that distributed yeah. system. And that's something we're working on here. So. Yeah, we are quite curious about the further development of lights across the research. Yeah. Because at this moment, we just have Linux running inside this. Right. We have an ARM, you know, it's an ARM 11. Yeah. And we have a Linux distribution inside, and we have some drivers to control the DOP. And these days, uh, we are embedding a GPU. It's a kind of NVD slot. Uh -huh. And then we are porting everything that we did in desktop PCs for, for this. Okay. Yeah, we should talk more about that. Yeah. So any other questions? If not, thank you again. Thank you, really thank you.